And so the idea was let's start doing research that will actually matter to people that can give them some actionable things they can do at home to make better plant medicines at home and make that research open source. What um, we found was that with percolation, we could extract approximately 80% of the CBD that was in the plant material in one run, and we could do it in approximately an hour. You know, if As you a- can cut through all of that and just know what for you is good cannabis, there's really only one way to that. And that's experimentation and careful observation. When I buy cannabis in dispensaries, I often buy some of the cheapest stuff they have. I'll say, what do you have that's testing below 15%? And I'll look at it. And as long as it smells good, I'll happily buy their their cheapest stuff. Or most Um, anyone who operates in the cannabis space for long enough, they know that if you send flour to five different labs, you're going to get five slightly, if not very different results. The cannabinoid Um, concentrations did not correlate with whether someone reported that they liked a product or not. But what was more interesting that often got misreported and overlooked was that the study also showed that the terpene data also did not correlate to whether someone was going to have a good experience or not. But what did correlate was aroma. And we so often talk about terpenes being the end-all be-all to cannabis aroma, but they're not the only compounds responsible for aroma. Hello, everybody. Hello. Welcome. Hi. Oh, Hi. this is fun. Yes. Hey, hey, everybody. Happy Monday, nerds. We are all <laughs> here gathered in the <laughs> for one reason and one reason only to be giant cannabis nerds. Especially this month. Especially <gasps> this month. Yes. Yeah. So nerdy. I'm excited about being uh, a mega nerd tonight. Hands up. Yay. <laughs> Always. <laughs> I don't know who said that. Oh, Jason, that was you. <laughs> awesome. Welcome, welcome. Okay, people are filing in as well. Andrew, you want to keep letting folks in and I'm going to yeah. lay down the law? Sure. Awesome. Cool. Hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Corinne Tobias. I'm the founder of Wake and Bake, and I'm also the program director at the Cannabis Coaching Institute. We are here today to uh, move the mission forward that we have, which is to educate as many people as humanly possible about this incredible dynamic plant medicine and to learn about it ourselves as much as we possibly can. Um, Thank you all for being here. We're really, really grateful that you're taking time out of your day uh, to learn more about this plant with someone who knows so much about it, who wrote the book on cannabis, which he called curious about cannabis, which I think is a little bit, you know, it seems a little casual for what the book is actually like. (laughs) All right, well, we'll get into that in just a moment. We're here with Jason Wilson, again, author of curious about cannabis. And everybody, just so you know, this is brought to you by the Cannabis Coaching Institute, where Andrea and I both work. It is a really cool place to be. Um, We have a new updated version of the Certified Cannabis Educator Program that we are really excited to share with you today. We'll talk a little bit more about it at the end, but I would love for you, Andrea, um, to give us just a brief overview of what it includes. Yeah, we are so excited about this like educator program version 3.0 that just is rolling out literally right now. Um, It's what Corinne and I have been doing for the past 15 years combined, which is get paid to talk and write about cannabis. That's why we're here tonight. This is like our job. We get paid to do this stuff, which is really awesome. Um, So in our new upgraded version, you of course get the full cannabis science curriculum so that you can be the resource in your community in person or online. And it's not just like super nerdy stuff, although like I definitely trend toward the nerd on this. We're teaching you about how and why cannabis works with an emphasis on how to talk to other people about it so that their eyes don't glaze over, even if you are a super nerd. And besides teaching you all about the science of cannabis, we're also giving you the tools to help you turn this into a business, your own business, something that you own in the cannabis space so that you can create your own side hustle or even full-time career. It comes with a fully done for you website. It's literally plug and play. You type in your, what you want it to say, and it will be made for you. 
all the um, capabilities are built into, you know, you have a scheduler, you have email, all that stuff is built into these custom built websites. You also get 14 done for you workshops so that you can start talking, teaching people about cannabis again, online or around the world. You can do these workshops anywhere. You get a done for you retreat. Plus you get templates, blogs, sorry, templates and checklists, et cetera, to create monetized content like blogs or podcasts, YouTube um, videos, et cetera. So CCI runs the only program where you can get certified to help other people understand cannabis, plus all the done for you business materials and mentorship and support from the community and people who have actually done it. How do they find out more, Corinne? Awesome. Yes. I will pop a, a link into the chat where you can book a call with us. If you know that you want to do this as a job and you're interested in getting trained. So I will do that in just a moment. This is awesome. Um, Cynthia Jones, uh, just posted in the chat that she's currently working with a cannabis coach who was recommended by CCI and she's been indulging for 40 years, but now is learning the real science behind everything. So it's awesome to have a coach. It's awesome to be a coach. Um, we've got some students. We've got some folks who are working in dispensaries. This is amazing. Oh, thanks, Amanda. Amanda says it's an awesome program. Oh, current CCI students loving everything about it. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Rad. Um, yeah, so I will pop that in the chat. Um, and... And I'll anything? introduce the star of the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do that. I'm just yeah. going to pop this in the chat. <laughs> Thanks. So book club is like, like my little baby, right? Like I love cannabis books. And when I first got curious about cannabis, the second edition, I underlined everything. And this is like my thing that I do with cannabis books. I can tell how much like I'm having my mind blown by how much underlining or destroying or highlighting, or sometimes I like write swear words in the, in the side, like what the you know, bad word. Cause I like, I'm having my mind blown. So I read the first, that version of it. And like immediately like started stalking Jason and being like, I need to learn more from this guy. Last year, I was really fortunate to take one of his like long nerdy workshop courses and like dive into science a lot, a lot of science. And um, we're so lucky to have him here with us today so that he can talk about his new updated new version of Curious About Cannabis. And if you're a super nerd or a cannabis um, educator, like he's doing the work for us. He's got like a student workbook and the teacher answer book, basically. So um, he's going to be a great um, resource for all of us here who just absolutely love nerding out about cannabis science. So let me tell you about him. Jason Wilson has his master's in science. He's also a science educator and natural products researcher that has specialized in studying the cannabis plant and its chemical constituents. He's the host of the popular science podcast, the curious about cannabis podcast. Definitely go check that out. He's got a huge backlist of um, so much amazing science. So definitely check that out. It's one of my favorites. I listen to it all the time. Um, he serves as a scientific advisor to a variety of cannabis companies and universities across the United States and regularly provides trainings, guest lectures, seminars, classes, and workshops on cannabis and cannabinoid science topics for audiences, including the general public, cannabis industry workers, research regulators, and healthcare professionals. Actually, one of the things that I love most about Jason is that he's able to take really, really, really complex topics and um, shed light on it, but also shed nuance on it. So much of what he talks about is very nuanced because cannabis is very nuanced. Outside of the Curious About Cannabis ecosystem, Jason, Jason is a principal scientist for the Natural Learning Laboratories and the CEO for Natural Learning Enterprises where he focuses his energy on developing educational media that helps promote public scientific literacy and critical thinking about life and the natural world. Corinne, I don't know if you know this, um, he's the author of the children's book, A Toadstool's Tre Treasures, Journey into the Fascinating World of Fungi. Yeah, right? And the producer and host of the Science and Philosophy podcast, Isn't Life Curious? And we'll have links to all of this on the replay um, tomorrow so that you can check it all out and go follow Jason and dive in. So I'm going to start with the first question. I want to start with terpenes. So for lots of people, myself included, when you start learning about terpenes, you're like, oh my God, terpenes are the thing. Like if I can just like match the smells to the effects that the book says it has, then I'm definitely going to feel this way. 
Um, and like, I definitely like fell down that hole too. And it wasn't until I was reading your book that you started to teach me about like the real nuances there. And most importantly for me, that that we're not even like, we have so many problems with terpenes. We're not testing for the right terpenes. There's an anti of terpenes. So can you talk to us? Can you like dive into some of the nuance around terpenes and what it means for us as cannabis consumers who are trying to use cannabis to feel better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks so much for having me on and um, bringing attention to the book and sharing your experiences with the class. Um, that's all very nice of you. And, um, I've, I've really appreciated everything you've had to say about your experience, um, in the master class last year. Um, it's a, it's a really intensive course. So it's, it's something that, um, I think is not to be taken lightly. So, um, yeah, uh, really good to see you again. Um, so the thing with terpenes, like you said, when people first learn about terpenes, generally, what's understood is that they're responsible for a lot of the smells of cannabis and a common analogy that's used among a lot of educators is that while cannabinoids are kind of the um, applying the, the gas on the car, more or less that the terpenes are steering the vehicle. And it's an easy analogy to kind of understand that, that these compounds are working together um, to produce an experience. And folks have gotten excited about this idea of, well, maybe terpenes are kind of the missing piece of the entourage effect and how we understand, you know, it's most people understand that you can have a lot of different cannabis flower that all tests around the same THC percentage, and they all deliver very different effects. And so that's kind of where this question comes from. Why do these different um, products have different effects? And the push towards terpenes kind of came about because of the early research in the early to early 2000s to 2010s. Um, researchers were really focused on looking at THC and CBD concentrations, as well as ratios of THC to CBD. And Enjoy. they noticed this trend that you're, you know, you have all these different effects that seem to transcend these cannabinoid concentrations. So then effort went to, to look at terpenes and to start trying to categorize cannabis flower based on the terpene profiles. And it's, it's been remarkable work. And there's actually really interesting things that have come about. For instance, we know that some terpenes do interact with um, cannabinoid receptors. beta caryophylline is one of the most commonly um, referenced terpene in this regard. It's a sesquiterpene that's very, very common in all types of cannabis, and it has direct effects on the CB2 receptor. And there's actually research that just came out that'll be in the next edition of Curious About Cannabis whenever we get there that has shown that when beta caryophylline is administered in conjunction with CBD, that there are effects in the body that seem to happen that are connected to CB1 receptor activity. And we don't understand exactly what's going on there because CBD doesn't really have affinity for CB1 receptors and neither does beta caryophylline. So there's some interesting activity going on with terpenes in relation to how it modulates the endocannabinoid system. However, there are a lot of things we don't know. And what's really happened in the cannabis industry is a lot of people have kind of um, jumped ahead of the science a bit and tried to, as you said, like connect different terpene profiles to effects to then try to use, you know, for instance, a certificate of analysis for a cannabis product and to say, okay, what are the top terpenes in that product? Okay, we can, you know, kind of predict the effects based on that. And then we can make targeted recommendations to consumers. Um, but, you know, myself and others have speculated that that's problematic for a number of reasons for a while, but there's actually a research study that came out last year that really um, kind of verified some suspicions that some of us have had about this approach. Um, so there was a study uh, published by um, Jeremy Plum and, uh, and some of his associates, Dr. A.D. Ray, um, some other kind of Oregonian researchers that if any of you are from Oregon, you're almost certainly familiar with their names, um, but they've been kind of big movers in cannabis research over the past 10 years. 
And um, they published a study called The Nose Nose is the kind of shorthand um, title. And if you go on Google Scholar and type in The Nose Nose Cannabis, you'll find it. And the study, um, it was interesting for a couple of reasons. One, the study pointed out that um, if you go to these big cannabis consumption events, um, so this focused on the Cultivation Classic, which is a big, um, you know, kind of cannabis tasting and judging event that takes place in Oregon. Um, they collected data from a couple of years of these events using standardized surveys and, and other protocols. And what they found is that, as expected, the cannabinoid concentrations did not correlate with whether someone reported that they liked a product or not. Um, but what was more interesting that often got misreported and overlooked was that the study also showed that the terpene data also did not correlate to whether um, someone was going to have a good experience or not. But what did correlate was aroma. And we so often talk about terpenes being the end-all be-all to cannabis aroma, um, but there's, there's several issues. One, they're not the only compounds responsible for aroma. Um, for example, there are volatile aldehydes, which are not terpenoids, although they can result from the breakdown of terpenoids that contribute to at least half of the detectable aroma that we get from cannabis. And so this study kind of transcended some deficits in our testing data um, to get at the subjective experience and found that there's a lot not being accounted for. And um, there are other issues too. You know, I so my background, I don't know how many of you are aware of, of my work in the canvas space or anything, but I most of my work is has been spent in building um, different types of research labs, testing labs, um, developing methods to understand cannabis products, how to interpret the data, how to develop better products, that sort of thing. And so I've tested a ton of cannabis products in my life and am very familiar with the challenges uh, around testing and um, interpreting data. And one thing that I'm aware of is that um, a lot of the data around terpenes that's currently available um, is all over the place. The quality control is not very good on a lot of this data. And um, it's not, we already know that cannabinoid data is often not comparable lab to lab. Like you can take flour to five different labs and get substantially different results. Well, that issue is much more uh, significant when we start talking about terpenes. Um, and this is for a number of reasons. One, Terpene testing is not generally required for regulatory compliance in a lot of places. So that means the labs don't have to go through quite as rigorous of a validation process to get those methods online. Um, but then there are other issues too, even if the data on the testing side was reliable and good, um, there's the fact that terpene concentrations change a lot, especially in cannabis flower over time. So you can have a result from when that material was recently cured, but that test result may not actually reflect the chemistry of the product by the time it's at home with somebody and in their grinder. And then if someone grinds that material and leaves it ground for a little while, the terpene profile will change quite a bit again um, because terpenes will volatilize away, they oxidize and transform. They're very sensitive compounds. So there's, there's multiple issues here when we talk about terpenes. And I just feel very strongly that right now, one, the data that's out there is not valid yet um, until we have better standardized methods. And we know that the methods testing labs are using are rigorously validated. Um, we can't even trust that data. So we have that, that problem to deal with. Another issue that you referenced um, that really gets into the nerdy weeds of things is enantiomers. So um, terpenes, as well as many, many chemicals in nature, they can show up kind of, you could think of it as like a left hand and a right hand situation where they're the same chemical structure, but they're just mirror images of each other. And they can be kind of stacked on top of each other um, and, you know, be shown that they have the same sort of symmetry. But when you try to overlay them on top of each other um, directly, you know, you can see that they're different, just like our, our hands. So this is called chirality. 
um, this, this concept in chemistry that you have molecules that often have a, um, some point in them where they can swivel and turn and have these kind of mirror images of each other. Well, it's really hard to tell the difference between these left-hand and right-hand versions of these terpenes. Um, it's, it's quite difficult. And most labs that are doing commercial terpene testing don't have the either the equipment or the methods established to really sort those things out. And there's only a couple of labs I'm aware of in North America, at least, that have, have really taken that problem on. And most of them are not commercial high throughput testing labs. They are R&D labs or product manufacturing labs that have um, resources that some of the commercial testing labs don't have to kind of do investigative um, research. So yeah, there's multiple and that, problems. And that one goes deeper for me. That was what was really weird for me was that like D-limonene versus L-limonene actually have different effects. So you're excited because you have a lab test that's, that says limonene and you're like, oh, I know limonene does this, but which limonene and, you know, so. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And they smell different. I mean, you know, even though the molecules can look very similar, they can be very different. And Another assumption that's kind of built into all of this too that I really want to highlight is this assumption that the dominant chemicals are driving the effects. So like if we understand the top three terpenes, we can understand something. But you know, what we learn from studying the entourage effect is that minor, quote unquote, minor constituents can actually play pretty big roles in the end effects. For instance, um, some folks have kind of seen the news over the past year or so about THCP, um, you know, a THC analog that was found to actually be produced in cannabis. And it has affinity for CB1 receptors that's far greater than THC. And so its contribution to effects on the CB1 receptor, theoretically, um, will be quite a lot more, even though it's in low concentrations. Well, that the same sort of thing can take place for terpenes as well. And so I think it's important for us not to get to, it's kind of like the, the natural reductionist mind approach to all of this. Like we have to be very careful not to get too caught up in trying to identify the primary active ingredients and put all of the, the impetus on those things, because some of these minor components actually may tell us quite a lot about what's driving some of these things. And some of the best researchers, most renowned cannabis researchers in the world that I've talked to are now thinking much more about these trace cannabinoid constituents and the role that they're playing in driving these unique effects more so than terpenes. Um, and so it's just one of these things. Terpenes have a role. We just don't quite understand what that role is and how much of that is extremely subjective person to person versus what's more objective and predictable. Um, so I hope that makes sense, but there's a lot of complexity there around trying to understand terpenes, how we should interpret them and, and what to do with that information. Yeah. Okay. I want to go there. I want to go with the, what to do with that information. Cause I want to know where the rubber meets the road on this, but I don't think I've ever seen the chat. So quiet. Everyone is just like, what? <laughs> and I think there's just, <laughs> they're all laughing because they know it's true, but it's so interesting. And I, I love this because I think for so many of us who have been, you know, working with this plant and learning about this plant and studying for years, the terpene answer just like, wasn't really there for us. And you're like, yeah, I guess. Okay. Um, so I, so I'm smirking over here because every time we have a graduate that leaves CCI and they're like, no terpenes are the answer. I'm like, okay, cool. it. Okay. Just calm down. Like let's, let's take a step back. And so I feel a little validated. I feel seen Jason. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Um, yes, yeah. and, and also I want to know, so then what is the approach in the nose nose like that kind of, uh, that with that in mind, how do you approach cannabis? Well, you know, it's, it's frustrating for some people, the answer I'm about to give, but it's just the most honest answer there is, which is you have to try a bunch of things and listen to your body and learn how you respond to things. And I think paying attention to the organoleptic characteristics of cannabis is huge, as the study that I referenced from last year highlights, um, paying attention to 
what aromas you're drawn towards, how you tend to respond to different, it, this is, you know, in the context of flower, if you're using cannabis flower, um, what aromas you're drawn to, uh, keeping a journal or some sort of way of tracking, you know, there are apps now that do this. Um, there's so many different ways to kind of track your consumption and try to get better insights into that. But, you know, I'm a long term, long time cannabis user, you know, it's since my early twenties. Um, and I've been down all of the rabbit holes that I think anyone can go down the rabbit hole of strain names, indica sativa, uh, terpene profiles, um, all of that. And, you know, I can say where I've ended up, you know, I, I've always ended up just going back to um, your skills of being able to assess the quality of cannabis um, in person, which is hard in places like, you know, in Canada, a lot of states in the United States, I'm in Mississippi right now in the United States, the medical program here, everything's prepackaged. So that means you don't get to look in a jar and smell something and watch them package it up for you. Um, I guess it depends because I know Canada, you know, province to province, it can be a little different, but, um, you know, that's something that I've been trying to get people to pay attention to is that there's scientific backing to the idea that patients and consumers in general need to have access to organoleptically evaluate cannabis and that it's actually a disservice and possibly even harming patients to not let them do that. Um, because the best scientific evidence we have is that that smell and the feel, and, you know, there are other qualities you can pick up on, um, people tune into that over time as they become experienced and above all else, above all of these other labels we attach to these products, you know, if you can cut through all of that and just know what for you is good cannabis in the context of which you use it, um, there's, there's really only one way to that. And that's experimentation and careful observation. There are genetic tests to try to help you answer some of those questions. And I've played around with those. And on my YouTube channel, I reviewed one and went over the results that I got back for a DNA test that looks at, you know, your endocannabinoid system markers and stuff, but I can go on an hour long rant about why that's, you know, misguided and limited to, um, the truth is just the science, the data is not exactly where we've been led to believe it's at. And we need to be honest about that and, um, you know, accept that there's quite a bit of experimentation left to do. Okay. So try a bunch of different types of weed and then be mindful. That sounds great. That sounds, <laughs> I always, I know it is, uns it's there, it is kind of an unsatisfying answer because you want to be able to go look for this thing. That's why terpenes are so satisfying to so many people, especially coaches and educators, which I know there are many of you in the room, people who work in dispensaries, you want to say, oh, this right here, this combination of things is going to feel like this. We want to have these predictive effects for things. So thank you for shedding some light on that um, and where we're at. Do you think, do you see a future where we can do that? Or go this maybe of our does this maybe um you know so there's there's an interesting tool i assume it's still available um that i recommend everyone go play around with it's called connect by confident cannabis which is a technology company that's been uh providing software solutions to they started out targeting cannabis labs and making sure that data going into their system was as good data as it could be from licensed cannabis testing labs. And then they've kind of opened their software up in different ways to other parts of the industry. But if you go to connect.confidentcannabis.com, there's a little data visualization tool you can play with where you can see a three-dimensional cloud of dots that all represent chemical profiles of different cannabis products. And the further away the dots are from each other, the more different they are. And one thing you can see is that there's one terpene that people tend to um, more or less agree with in terms of um, predicted effects. It's the only one that, that has this um, trend, but it's terpenaline. A lot of people report terpenaline as being a quote unquote sativa. Um, and again, it's the only one that there's this really strong correlation. Um, and so, you know, that tells us that for a lot of people, terpenaline dominant things seem to be producing um, more 
um, kind of stimulating effects of, of some sort. Why that is, or you know, the details of that, is it actually terpenaline or is there other things correlated with terpenaline that are um, driving that? We don't know, but you know, based on all of this data that's building in this database, it, that's the one where there, there does seem to be some predictable value there. Um, so if any of you are like, but I know terpenaline, you know, has this issue. Um, yeah, there's some, you know, there's a little bit of data backing that. The rest of it, not so much. You know, the indica sativa labels, all of the strain names, all of the um, other sort of correlations between terpenes and effects don't seem to hold up at all. But um, that's one that does, which gives us some sense that maybe once we know the right questions to ask and we know that we can rely on the data that we're bringing in, um, maybe we will get there um, in a way that tells us how most users are likely to respond to certain things. Um, but right now, it's it's just uh, it's just all over the place, and you know we just don't actually know what the chemistry of the products are before the 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 uh, person consumes them. There was a study that was published this year actually that I got in trouble for criticizing on social media because it was a big survey study um, that claimed to associate a lot of terpenes to different outcomes. And um, there were a lot of big issues around the validity of the data and how these connections were made. However, the, the positive side I tried to, to spin on that is the systems for associating the data with outcomes, um, those are very strong. And so once we can rely on the data that's being generated, um, and we get the, the chirality problem figured out, and we start looking at more compounds in cannabis, and we're able to assess the chemistry of these products right before people are using them, yes, we can get there, I believe, um, but it's still gonna be a while. These are some pretty significant um, you know, challenges to overcome to try to get all of that in line. This is amazing. Like one day we're going to be talking to our grandkids. Like, I remember when they used to classify it as indica and sativa. Yeah. Oh yeah. We <laughs> I love very that. close I, to that already. Yeah. Oh man. You hope so. But then you go online and then you're like live and well everywhere. Oh yeah. Every dispensary place. I go to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> every dispensary yeah. has the wall. I live in Colorado. We have one of the <laughs> oldest marketplaces. Every, every dispensary. I loved how you did air quotes like down here. You're like sativa. It's like, you can do those up here, Jason. We all, <laughs> we're all with it. <laughs> sativa gets a full air quote quote now. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, that absolutely. I hope that I hope that ramble made sense to folks. It's awesome. I love how you were like, yeah, we can totally get to a place where we can predict how cannabis is going to affect you. If we do 756 things before <laughs> then we'll be good. It'll be fine. No problem yeah. at all. You just have to, yeah, just have to <laughs> fix everything in between. <laughs> might take a decade. <laughs> a decade you're so generous with like how yeah that's awesome if it's a decade well, with the, that's with the cool. way machine learning and ai is getting integrated yeah. into uh bioinformatics it'll be fairly fast well that's gonna be crazy that's let's not go there <clears throat> let's not go into ai just yet let's let's geek out on this topic before we dive back into the book, I want to dive out of the book for a second because yeah. like, I'm like your biggest fan. So I just like follow you all around and stuff. And last, last year you published a study that you and a couple of other researchers did. And, um, it gets like really nerdy and deep into the weeds, but I'd love for you to talk to us about what you learned about how to make the most effective and efficient I guess efficient, not necessarily effective, but the mm -hmm. most efficient cannabis tincture. Um, can you tell us about that study just briefly and what it means for us at home who are trying yeah. to do alcohol extractions? Like what should we be doing? Cause you like, you did the science tell us. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is really the beginning of the work that my own lab has, you know, been trying to do. So this was the first study published under the natural learning laboratories, um, you know, sort of arm and it, I was the lead, um, author on it. And the, it was with my mentor, Dr. Kevin Spellman, that some of you may be familiar with. He's, he's one of the most brilliant, um, pharmacognosists, um, that I know, which pharmacognosy is the study of, of how, um, medicinal plants work basically. Um, and so him and I have done a good bit of work together. I still work with him regularly and something that we're very interested in, um, is how can we do science? How can we do publishable research that 
matters to the average person, to the average consumer, to people at home, you know, not research that is meant to be patented and to make some company billions of dollars, which is kind of the background that a lot of me and, and other folks that I kind of um, keep in my circles, that's kind of the background we come from, traditional natural products and biotech and all this stuff where we've been kind of um, run through the ringer quite a bit in doing research that never makes it out into the public eye, gets paywalled, or it's not published at all because some company wants to protect it for themselves. And we got really sick of that. And so the idea was let's start doing research that will actually matter to people that can give them some actionable things they can do at home to make better plant medicines at home and make that research open source. Um, so no paywalls involved, um, which has been quite a a task um, for folks that don't know, publishing research is a kind of its own racket, as you might imagine. And so it costs thousands of dollars even just to publish a study that is free for people to to read. It's all bizarre. But anyway, um, we had this idea of looking at just basic tincturing methods and trying to understand um, at what point when you're soaking the plant in ethanol in a jar, just like you do at home, when does that extraction sort of peak? Like when have you gotten the most CBD you're going to get out of that material so that you're not letting it sit too long and, and starting to extract chlorophyll and other things that you may not necessarily want in the extract. Um, you know, we, we have other studies that are we're working on getting published over the next couple of years that all stem from this one study that you're referencing um, but we, you know, tried to understand, you know, tweaking different variables using materials that anyone would have available at home. Um, you know, just what's driving all the extraction efficiency and how can we make it better? And one thing we wanted to look at that no one had done, at least in published research, um, which was comparing what's called maceration, which is your typical take your plant material, throw it in a jar, fill it with ethanol, shake it, you know, every now and then let it soak versus percolation, which is where it's basically like making coffee. You take your plant material, you fill up what's called a percolation cone, which very much looks like the top of a coffee pot or something. And you pre-soak your material in alcohol to kind of soften the tissues. And then you um, run alcohol through this percolation cone and it drips just like a coffee pot into a collection vessel. And um, to our knowledge, no one was really playing around with that concept in any serious way. Um, and certainly no one had compared, you know, how much CBD do you get when you extract that way versus maceration and how much time does it take and all that sort of thing. So um, we had a suspicion just based on our understanding of the preparation of other medicinal plants, we had a suspicion that percolation was probably going to be a better extraction method for people at home for a number of reasons, um, but we weren't sure. So we went through and did a series of, of trials. Um, we did a, a few maceration trials and a few percolation trials, and we compared the percolation technique to maceration at one hour, one day, um, two weeks, um, you know, just kind of some time scales like that. And we also threw in a variable of pressing and not pressing the plant material after it's extracted. Um, so for those of you that do any processing at home, you can get a little benchtop herb press and it's a uh, very simple, you know, two metal plates, basically you put your material in a usually in a nylon bag or something and uh, put it in the press and you just spin the top and it squishes everything that's in that press and the remaining any liquid, you know, will come out and you can collect. And that remaining liquid is usually, you know, super concentrated. And what we found on the other side was that with percolation, we could extract approximately 80% of um, at least the CBD that was in the plant material in one run. Um, and we could do it in approximately an hour, as opposed to with maceration, the only way to get close to that was to do between 
um, to do approximately a day long maceration and to press the plant material and get the remaining alcohol out of there, mix it all together, and then you've kind of got everything. So what this told us was that percolation not only was superior in just basic extraction efficiency, but it did not require um, pressing the plant material and it could be done in an hour. Um, so fairly quick, um, didn't require that press, got the maximum extraction efficiency, um, very, very suitable for home use. Um, and that was the first time anybody had ever looked at that or, or reported on that at all. Um, and it was a fairly simple study, but also the idea is with, with my lab, something I'm trying to figure out is how to teach people to do um, rigorous publishable scientific research at home. I think everyone is capable of being scientists, of being citizen scientists and contributing important data and information. And so this was the, the study was the sort of the beginning of trying to figure that mission out and, and to um, kind of get some projects going that, that might interest some folks. So that's, that's kind of the general takeaway. Can I just recap? So the most, the best way to do it would be to have a percolation set up mm -hmm. um, and then just like let it percolate and then you're done. But for home chefs who don't have that, although you kind of describe how we could do that with like yeah, a Perrier bottle. It. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can totally yeah. make it. We described, cause that's what we did. We tried to use only stuff that people could have around in their kitchen. And so instead of buying a nice fancy percolation cone, we literally made one out of a glass bottle. Um, yep. Okay. But if I didn't want to do that, am I hearing you right? That if I just left my tincture in the jar for a full day for a full 24 hours and then squeeze the hell out of it, that I would yeah. have the same effectiveness. Okay. That's yep. really good to know. And do you have an idea? Cause this was done on CBD. Do you feel like this is transferable to THC yeah. tinctures? Yeah, absolutely. The only way, only reason we chose CBD is because the facility we were working in was a hemp facility. Um, but the, you know, resin content, all of that sort of stuff was comparable to commercial THC rich cannabis and, um, the extraction efficiencies just from experience. I know that, um, they're, they're very, very similar, at least with ethanol. When you start getting into other types of extraction that can change quite a bit, but with ethanol, it's all transferable. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Let's get you into know, some questions from the chat. Hang on. I have a question. Okay, but go. Also, yeah. Like, you know, they're like nipping at your heels right now. Like, what about glycerin? What about all these fats? What about oils? Like, Oh yeah. They yeah. Wanna, yeah. yeah they want to get into it. Of things. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly where our head's at. You know, it just takes time and money and energy to go through all of this stuff the way that we want to do it. So it goes through peer review and gets published, but um, absolutely. Those are all great things to have in mind. I mean, um, there are so many variables we didn't tweak in the study because we were just limited by a lot of things, resources and time primarily. Um, but even just changing the, the uh, temperature of your ethanol has a huge impact in selectivity. Um, the colder you get that ethanol, the, the more select selective it's going to be towards oily, you know, um, lipophilic compounds, oil loving compounds. Um, but yeah, then you, you start talking about glycerin and, and all of these other types of oils you could do extraction with. Um, that's where we're headed. Those are the types of questions we want to, to provide answers for. Yay. I remember making my first cookbook in the kitchen. Like, why can't I just Google what is the best way to do this? And I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess. So, but when you said, you just mentioned something in passing, like part of this was this citizen scientist kind of thing, right? So we can all be asking the questions that we're asking. Are you yes. saying that there are ways for for us to, you know, be helpful in finding those answers and like working yeah. together? So, as, you know, I just launched a, um, a program that I plan on announcing on social media pretty soon. But right now it's just a new tier on the Curious About Cannabis Patreon, but it's a like research support tier. And it's basically a way to build a group of people that want to um, participate in trying to um, work on projects like this and to be featured as authors on the research. Um, and, and the biggest thing is just cost. All of these studies, they cost a whole lot more than people often think that they do. 
And the reason you don't see these studies published is because companies can't rationalize the cost because it doesn't lead to anything that's very profitable for them. Um, so that's the trick is figuring out how to fund all of the work. But yes, um, I'm launching a, a whole uh, new, I don't even know what to call it, but a, a new um, sort of membership tier for the Curious About Cannabis flat platform that is focused on um, this very project of how do we get more citizen scientists contributing information and data? How do we ensure that we're following the same protocols so that we can compare the data um, and, and all of that? And sort of the, um, the return on that is that anybody that contributes to that, we will get them listed as authors. So like literally your name will be on a research paper. You know, this study we published in um, Frontiers of Pharmacology, which is a very um, like well-respected, highly read um, research journal that's not a cannabis research journal, which was very important for us, even though I have a lot of respect for all of the journals that have been popping up that focus on cannabis science. We want um, this information to reach as broad an audience as possible, and we want it to also contribute to the reduction in stigma among researchers and, and the scientific community around um, this way of thinking um, when it comes to cannabis research and um, natural products research in general. So it's kind of an ambitious project, but we do, I am trying to um, figure out ways to get people involved in a way that's going to be productive and ensure we actually, um, you know, tackle these things and get some things done and not just talk about it. Yay. Yeah. You're at a cannabis coaching institute call. We do shit. So you've got a lot of people already like sign me up. I'm in, let's do this. Um, that is so exciting. It's like with nerd street cred answering these questions that we all want answers to and nerd street cred being listed as an author. That's so awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. I do. I am going to ask this question if that's, do we have time for it, Andrea? Cause I am incredibly curious you mentioned really briefly like some of the issues in lab testing and passing and mm -hmm. i've been dying to ask you this question um, because you do have so much experience in this world um in the book you talk about some of the issues with lab testing and we always encourage our students you know um and and people who worked with like get comprehensive lab testing don't just yeah. you know get any old thing um so they have a better idea of what they're consuming but but there are a lot of issues there. So can you extrapolate on this a bit? And I'd love to know specifically about different reference standards and pay for play THC testing. Cause I think those are two of the big ones. Yeah. You know, it's, it's good to have some perspective of the kind of history of cannabis testing. You know, it really started around 2010. Um, so one of the earliest cannabis testing labs was the workshop in California um, them and steep hill. And, um, they really, you know, got operations going, um, in around 2010 or so. So that's just to say that we're only about 13 years into the life of the cannabis testing world. And the cannabis testing space is very unique in some ways compared to natural products testing um, broadly. And one of the big things is all of this weight that gets put on the THC number. The fact that dispensaries tend to value product um, and distributors, it's not just dispensaries, there are multiple points along the um, you know, kind of uh, life cycle of cannabis that are responsible for pushing this. Um, valuation, but generally anything above 20% THC gets valued um, a little higher than things below that. And then anything that's 30% or higher these days um, kind of gets the premium price. And so what that's led to is, as you would imagine, is lab shopping. People are hunting for labs that will give them a competitive edge by giving them the highest numbers. And like I mentioned before, most anyone who operates in the cannabis space for long enough, they know that if you send flour to five different labs, you're going to get five slightly, if not very different results. Um, and there are several reasons for that. 
Um, one is a lack of standardization and oversight. Um, so even though every state has its own rules on cannabis testing and everything, there are, and most states require labs to be accredited, that accreditation doesn't mean that all these labs are using the same methods. All accreditation means is that a lab has demonstrated evidence that it has a quality control system, that it has SOPs for the methods it wants to do, and it has ways of ensuring that the data that they generate with those methods are accurate and precise according to whatever specifications they define for those methods. So um, one issue is that labs have taken advantage of the general ignorance of uh, most people, because why would you know the ins and outs and nuances of laboratory accreditation? You don't need to, you should never know that. Um, and so uh, there's been a, a bit of a, a thing on the lab side that they'll make claims like we're ISO accredited, which ISO is the international, um, you think of as the international standards organization. Um, and they provide international standards for all sorts of things, laboratories, quality systems across industries. And so labs will say, I'm ISO accredited. And that makes people assume then that they must be using some international standard for how they're testing, that their results are, are good, and um, that they do good work. That's kind of the general feeling people get. But accreditations apply to specific methods, to specific chemicals that you're testing for, a lab does not just get accreditation for everything that they do and will do. And I think that's a misconception people have. And so um, that's one way that labs kind of will be a little disingenuous sometimes um, is they'll lean on kind of part of an accreditation to make it seem like all their methods are accredited. That gets into the terpene issue and, and other things. Um, so there's there's some shoddy lab work happening that's kind of flying under the radar because um, they're kind of misusing language or taking advantage of people's ignorance. But then there are labs that are outright committing fraud too. And this, <laughs> it's such a tricky problem because I've seen it from all sides. You know, I, I've been working in you know, the lab that I built in Oregon, Kinevere Research, our whole mission was be as accurate as possible, bring the molecular biology and expertise that we have from studying natural products, bring it to cannabis. And what we found is that uh, we lost tons of clients. We lost lots of money. And eventually we had to sell that lab um, to stay alive. And um, meanwhile, we watched other labs thrive and we had clients come to our labs and tell us what was going on. And they would say, um, can you ensure a result is gonna be 25% or more? Well, such, such and such lab can, why can't you? You know, those awkward conversations start happening. Um, I've had friends of mine that are growers that bring me test results that they laugh about and they um, will show that some flower is 45% THC, which is physically impossible. And um, they know that the test result is not right. Um, and it's sort of a simultaneous laugh and cry situation that isn't this funny, you know, um, and also isn't this just so sad that this is where the industry's at, that um, lab data that we know is bad is just um, circulating for the sake of making sales and being tolerated. So it's an issue that is, um, it hits on on all sides. Like it's, there's not just one thing wrong. Like it's not just the labs. It's not just dispensaries valuing product based on these numbers. It's not just the distributors that, you know, push that even more. It's, it's not the producer's fault in trying to get, you know, the, the highest number that they want to have a competitive advantage. Um, it all just comes together to form a, a, a big cluster of problems. And um, what I generally say about lab testing with cannabis is when it comes to pesticides and microorganisms, a lot of that data is pretty darn reliable. And 
labs know that that data is more likely to come up in a lawsuit than the THC number. Um, and that when it comes to contaminants and all of that, that that's generally a, a bigger issue, a greater risk to manage to public health and safety than the THC number. So most labs are not skimping out on quality when it comes to that data. Although some do, there have been reports of, you know, several years ago, there were labs in Washington that um, got caught. They never failed a product for microbials and they, you know, never detected certain pesticides. So, I mean, that thing, that kind of thing does happen, but it's way less common than fraud around cannabinoid potency. And I gave a lecture that is on the Curious About Cannabis YouTube channel that I recommend people check out if you're interested in this problem, because I, I get regulators that come to me and say, how do we catch um, labs boosting THC numbers? And I, again, it, I hate being the bearer of bad news, but there aren't good ways to catch it because there are so many ways to do it. And so many ways that can be just baked into how the lab operates that even under close observation, they can get away with it if they know what they're doing. And so in that lecture, it's about an hour and a half long, I try to break down as many of these points as possible of where this, uh, you know, elevating of numbers can, can take place from sampling all the way to data reporting, um, just to give people an appreciation for how how hard this is to catch and regulate because people keep saying like, well, if the methods were just standardized, if the regulatory bodies had greater oversight, this problem would go away and maybe, um, but there are greater issues here that relate to um, uh, what I would say is just some philosophical issues around what we think about cannabis and what good cannabis is, what quality cannabis means. And as long as the market is valuing cannabis solely on THC, this problem will never go away. And so ultimately, this is, has to be fixed culturally, I think, um, that, that people have to um, care about more things than, than THC and, and start demanding that. And when I buy cannabis in dispensaries, I often buy some of the cheapest stuff they have. I'll say, <laughs> what do you have that's testing below 15%? And I'll look at it. And as long as it smells good, I'll happily buy their, their cheapest stuff um, because I know that the numbers are not important, totally unreliable, and some of the stuff that's the cheapest and quote unquote weakest can um, surprisingly also be the strongest. <laughs> and so it's, you know, that's that's the issue in a nutshell. Um, it's a tough one. It's a tough issue to tackle, and it requires a ton of consumer education to really start to change, you know, the problem. Jason, I don't know where you're from and how big nutshells are, but I it's, will say it's a big walnut of a nutshell. That's a big, that's a big ass nutshell. Awesome. No, thank you so much. I know Andrew was like, are you really want to open this, like this it's a, it's Pandora's, Pandora's box? box? I'm like, yeah. I do. I want to know. And that's so cool. Thank you again for coming full circle on that and telling us like what we can do with that. Like that, that, that's so, that's so it's so brilliant. Just like go in and, and go give me your lowest shelf stuff. It's not because I'm cheap. It's because I know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it really makes them think, I mean, I've really, um, without having to say anything else, just in bud tender, seeing my approach, I've seen them change the way they talk and present products to people. Cause it's, it's just not that common for them to see. They're so used to people saying, what's your highest THC? Do you go in incognito? I like going in incognito and pretending I don't know anything about cannabis and just being like, I have a lot of anxiety and you'll be surprised how many 26 year olds in Colorado will recommend dabs as the first option. Oh for yeah, anxiety. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do that um, for as long as it works. Usually I can get, go to a dispensary two or three times before they start to figure out who I am. And then, and then that all falls apart. But um, I do like to, I, I really enjoy doing that when I moved back to Mississippi because um, I got the total raw consumer experience, um, which was enlightening. That's awesome. We do have um, one question. Do you want to do one question from, from the folks, Andrea? Yeah, it kind of it kind of um, ties into what we're talking about, a lab, about lab testing. Um, one of our students, Louis, asked, um, 
asked about THCP and minor cannabinoids. Are they as volatile as terpenes? Like we're Um, not testing for these things necessarily. So, yeah, I mean, it depends on the size, you know, so, um, they're not as volatile as monoterpenes like terpenaline, myrcene, limonene, that sort of thing. Um, but you have to keep in mind that, um, terpenes, that's a, it's a huge class of chemicals of varying sizes. And once you get to ses, you know, cannab, most cannabinoids are slightly bigger than sesquiterpenes, like very slightly bigger, uh, if not very similar in size. Um, so some of these cannabinoids can be roughly as volatile as things like humulene, beta caryophylline, um, certainly as things like phytol, which is a, a much bigger, um, terpene. So they, they can be as volatile as terpenes. Um, not just not as much as, as monoterpenes, which are some of the main things you're smelling, um, when you think about, um, aromatic terpenes. Okay. That's great. Thanks for, for doing that. Yeah, you're right. This like hour blew by. I knew it. I knew I should have booked like an eight hour book club with Jason (laughs) Wilson. (laughs) Yeah, let's do it. We'll have like a lock-in with Jason Wilson. (laughs) We'll get our jammies on and hot cocoa. Oh yeah, we could. Yeah, just, yep. That'd be super fun. Do it overnight. (laughs) He said, yep. You guys heard that, right? He said, yep. It's recorded. recorded. The 24 hour stream (laughs) begins now. (laughs) That'd be so fun. For people who want to find you, where can they find you? What's coming up next for you? And again, we'll put all the links um, to all your stuff that you shared earlier, but where's one place that people can go to get all their Jason Wilson in? Yeah. I mean, the best place as far as Curious About Cannabis goes is cacpodcast.com or curiousaboutcannabis.net. Someone's still curiousaboutcannabis.com from me, but one day we'll get it back. Um, But um, so that's that's really the, the entry point to all things Curious About Cannabis. If you're interested in the broader education that I do, naturaledu.com would be a good place to go. There you can kind of see all of the different um, projects that I actively work on. Certainly curious about cannabis is the one I'm most active on. If you're also interested in psychedelics, there's a serious about psychedelics program in development um, that you can stay on top of if you go to naturaledu and hunt that down. And if you're interested in just stuff about me, I have a website, jasonwilsonms.com, um, where I, I try to update it when I have stuff going on. Um, other than that, the only thing coming up is I'm hoping to launch the first Curious About Cannabis teacher training um, later this year. So um, the point of that is to try to prepare people to utilize curious about cannabis materials to teach about cannabis science, but also to share my own philosophy around teaching. You know, I'm not just trained in science, but I I did my half of my graduate work was masters of teaching stuff. And so trying to just kind of um, share some of the philosophical side of how I think about education and teaching and the opportunities there, how to leverage certain tools to um, teach about cannabis science more effectively and then I have tons of resources, you know, 160 slide deck um, related to Curious About Cannabis content that I make available to folks that, you know, I feel comfortable with them going out into the world and teaching with it. So that'll be a test run. We'll try the first cohort of that um, this fall sometime. So um, if any of you are interested in that, um, it's all specifically about cannabis science. Um, so if you're wanting to kind of... Um, up your game in terms of how you teach about cannabis science and, you know, to, to varying audiences, we'll, we'll have a workshop for that. And I think it'll be a lot of fun. Oh my gosh. It'll be a lot of fun. I know. I'm like, (laughs) Oh, you've got a psychedelics one. You've got a teacher training. I'm in, (laughs) most of us have that, um, that certification problem, you know, where you're like, Oh, I can get certified in that. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. amazing. Okay. Thank you so much, Jason. Really, really appreciate yeah, it. Thank y'all so much. Oh my goodness. This has been really incredible seeing all of you here. And thank you all for your commitment to learning more about this plant. We really, we are so appreciative that you came here and that you gave Jason uh, your attention for, for this past hour. I'm, I hope that you took so much or you're taking so much away. And we hope that you share that with someone. We hope that you share that with a lot of people. Um, as Jason said, this is a lot of this is a culture issue. A lot of this is an education issue because people 
don't know the questions to ask. So we're not getting the answers that we need, um, you know, especially with the general public, you know, and the scientific community kind of keeps themselves away from the general public so often. And so we need as many people out there as possible who know what they're talking about when it comes to general cannabis science and, and are able to speak to it in a way that it actually matters for people that people can actually use it. So again, we've got those discovery calls. Um, Andrew, if you want to put the link in too, where, where Andrew and I will get on the phone, if you want to learn how to get paid to talk and write about cannabis and do this as a job. Um, there are many pathways to doing that. Um, and we would love to support you in that. These calls are free. We'll talk about what kind of career you want to build, who you want to be helping, what that actually looks like for you. And if the Cannabis Coaching Institute is a good fit, we'll invite you into one of our programs. If not, we'll point you in the right direction. Like we're really lucky that there are more and more options out there every day to get trained, to learn about cannabis and to talk to people about it. So we're stoked. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, yeah, thank and you. Y'all so are much. doing great work. So y'all keep up what you're doing. It's awesome. Thank you, you too. <laughs> <laughs> if you so are kind. really, if you're really worried, like you were starting to cry this morning because this is our last book club, it's okay. I have decided that we're still doing book club. <laughs> right, Lisa? See, Lisa and I, right? Lisa and I are so happy right now. So for our next book club, I'm going to put the link in the chat. This is a book called Homegrown Cannabis. If you're in CCI, you know that I personally believe that if you have the ability to, if you know, if it's legally available to you, that you should definitely grow your own cannabis. It is a spiritual experience. You get to like learn from your medicine. It is a weed. It's relatively easy to grow. So um, we're going to be joined by the author, Alexis Burnett, um, next month. He's written a beautiful picture filled book about growing cannabis, and he's been growing outside organically regenerative farming. Oh, Catherine already has it. Awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, yeah. And we're going to meet next month or sorry, the first Monday of the month. So let me just pull up my calendar and make sure I have the date, right? Um, yeah, it's uh, Monday, May 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern so that we don't have these 30s that, <laughs> that drive people crazy. Um, and if you and if you if you're on the list for this, you'll you'll get emails about this coming up so you don't have to uh, worry about that. So, yeah, I'm really excited to continue book club with y'all. And if you have any suggestions for me on books that we should cover after that, please let me know at support at Cannabis Coaching Institute dot com because I love you, you guys want to hear you guys want to hear a funny story what happened today i go andrew's like i want to keep doing book club and i was like we have so much other stuff going on but okay i know how much you love book club book club is always fun and then like five minutes later i got the invite for for the next book club and i was like she's been planning this the whole time <laughs> She's ready to hit the button. <laughs> she was ready. It was so quick. Don't think that I didn't notice that, Andrea. You're plotting. <laughs> yes, that's going to be awesome. What great timing. Someone just said in the chat, like this is their first book club and they're getting ready to start their first plant. How cool would it be for those of you, especially who've never grown before to do that this summer? We all get to get together. You can start, you read the book now in the next month, ask your questions and then grow some cannabis this year. Like if you have, haven't ever done it because you're like, I don't really know. And what if I kill it and fuck it up? This is the time. Cause you'll have a professional to ask all of your questions to and get you off to a good start. I'll Exciting. also say for anyone wanting to get started growing, if you're nervous about killing plants, we all have killed lots of plants <laughs> here in the <good> company. <laughs> Yeah. You'll so never forget sad. your first. You'll That's never right. forget That's the first. Right. I, I actually, one of the best growers I know described it as like, it is like um, the more plants that you've killed, the more lessons you've learned. That's how That's you right. get good. And I was like, That's, you're a murderer. That's, you can't just, they're like by the wayside. He's like, Well, just another one bit the dust. I learned you couldn't put that in that corner. And I'm like, Oh, that's mean. <laughs> but it is true. We're all gonna, we're all gonna geek out together. Thanks again, Jason. Thanks everybody so much yeah, for being thanks. here. We love doing this with you. We love that this is our job. I'm so happy that you're here with us. So this will be posted on our Cannabis Coaching Institute YouTube channel, the replay in the next couple of days, and we'll see you in a month. Cool. Bye. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Bye everybody.